Hello. <clears throat> Cable 2. Today, I've got a new story for you. It's, uh, mm, it's fa I want to say it's fantasy, but it's supposed to kind of precede the fantasy genre a little bit. Uh, you know, I mean, kind of as like a, like a bridge from like the really old, the really old stuff, like the medieval romances and stuff to what we now think of as like fantasy novels. It's a story by William Morris. I haven't actually read it myself yet. Chapters here are pretty short. I don't know. Well, I mean, no, I'm sure we're not going to do just one chapter for today's stream. So, yeah. We're going to be starting with... Hmm. Yeah, let me go ahead and put that on screen. Chapter title. <clears throat> one moment. Chapter one. Oh yeah, so this is the. W Hang on. Okay. <clears throat> the wood beyond the world, chapter one, of Golden Walter and his father. A while ago, there was a young man dwelling in a great and goodly city by the sea which had the name Langton on Holm. He was but of five and twenty winters, a fair-haced man, tada, fair-faced man, yellow-haired, tall and strong, rather wiser than foolisher than young men are mostly wont, a valiant youth and a kind, not of many words, but courteous of speech, no roisterer, not masterful, but peaceable and knowing how to forbear. In a fray, a perilous foe and a trusty war-fellow, his father, with whom he was dwelling when this tale begins, was a great merchant, richer than a baron of the land, and a headman of the greatest of the lineages of Langton, and a captain of the port. He was of the lineage of the Goldings. Therefore was he called Bartholomew Golden, and his son, Golden Walter. Now, you may well deem that such a youngling as this was looked upon by all as a lucky man without a lack, but there was this flaw in his lot, whereas he had fallen into the toils of love of a woman exceeding fair, and had taken her to wife, she not unwilling, as it seemed. But when they had been wedded some six months, he found by manifest tokens that his fairness was not so much to her, but that she must seek the foulness of one worser than he in all ways. Wherefore his rest departed from him, whereas he hated her for her untruth and her hatred of him. Yet would the sound of her voice, as she came and went in the house, make his heart beat, and the sight of her stirred desire within him, so that he longed for her to be sweet and kind with him, and deemed that, might it be so, he should forget all the evil gone by. But it was not so. Forever when she saw him her face changed, and her hatred of him became manifest, and howsoever she were sweet with others, with him she was hard and sour. So this went on a while, till the chambers of his father's house, <coughs> of his father's house, yea, the very streets of the city, became loathsome to him. And yet he called to mind that the world was wide, and he but a young man. So on a day, as he sat with his father alone, he spake to him and said, Father, I was on the quays even now, and I looked on the ships that were nigh bound, and thy sign I saw on a tall ship that seemed to be not that seemed to me nighest bound. Will it be long ere she sail? Nay, said his father, that ship, which hight the Catherine, will they warp out of the haven in two days' time. But why askest thou of her? The shortest word is best, father, said Walter, and this it is, that I would depart in the said ship and see other lands. Yea, and whither, son, said the merchant? 
Whither she goeth, said Walter, for I am ill at ease at home, as thou wottest, father. The merchant held his peace a while, and looked hard on his son, for there was strong love between them. But at last he said, Well, son, maybe it were best for thee, but maybe also we shall not meet again. Yet if we do meet, father, then thou shalt see a new man in me. Well, said Bartholomew, at least I know on whom to lay the loss of thee, and when thou art gone, for thou shalt have thine own way herein, she shall no longer abide in my house. Nay, but it were for the strife that should arise thenceforth between her, uh, between her kindred and ours, it should go somewhat worse with her than that. Said Walter, I pray thee shame her not more than, uh, than needs must be, lest so doing thou shame both me and thyself also. Bartholomew held his peace again for a while. Then he said, Goeth she with child, my son? Walter reddened and said, I wot not, nor of whom the child may be. Then they both sat silent, till Bartholomew spake, saying, The end of it is, son, that this is Monday, and that thou shalt go aboard in the small hours of Wednesday. And meanwhile I shall look to it that thou may not go that thou, <clears throat> that thou go not away empty handed. The skipper of the Catherine is a good man and true, and knows the seas well. And my servant Robert the Low, who is clerk of the lading, is a trustworthy is trustworthy and wise, and as myself in all matters that uh, look towards chaffer. The Catherine is new and stout builded, and should be lucky, whereas she is under the ward of her who is the saint uh, the saint called upon in, in the church, where thou wert christened, and myself before thee, and thy mother and my father and mother all lie under the chancel thereof, as thou wottest. Therefore the elder rose up, and went his ways about his business, and there was no more said betwixt him and his son on this matter. All right, chapter 2. There it is. <clears throat> Chapter 2. Golden Walter takes ship to sail the seas. When Walter went down to, Catherine the, to, the, to the Catherine the next morning, there was the skipper Geoffrey, who did him reverence, and made him all cheer, and showed him to his room aboard ship, and the plenteous goods which his father had sent down to the quays already, such haste as he had made. Walter thanked his father's love in his heart, but otherwise took little heed to his affairs, but wore away the time about the haven, gazing listlessly on the ships that were making them ready outward, or unlading, or, and the mariners and aliens coming and going, and all these were to him as the curious images woven on a tapestry. At last, when, uh, when he had well nigh come back around to the Catherine, he saw there a tall ship, which he had scarce noted before, a ship all bound, which had her boats out, and men sitting to the oars thereof, ready to tow her outwards when the hawser should be cast off. And by seeming her mariners were but abiding for some one or, or other to come aboard. So Walter stood idly watching the said ship, and as he looked, lo, folk passing him uh, toward the gangway. These were three. First came a dwarf, dark brown of hue and hideous, with long arms and ears exceeding great, and dog teeth that stuck out like the fangs of a wild beast. He was clad in a rich coat of yellow silk, and bare in his hand was a crooked bow, and was girt with a broad sax. After him came a maiden, young by seeming, of scarce twenty summers, fair of face as a flower, gray-eyed, brown-haired, with lips full of red, uh, full and red, uh, slim and gentle of body, 
Simple was her array, of a short and straight green gown, so that on her right ankle was clear to see an iron ring. One moment. <sighs> Last of the three was a lady, tall and stately, so radiant of visage and glorious of raiment, that it were hard to say what she was like, or sorry, what like she was. <clears throat> For scarce might the, might the eye gaze steady upon her exceeding beauty, yet must every son of Adam who found himself anigh her lift up his eyes again after he had dropped them, and look again on her, and yet again, and yet again. Even so did Walter, and as the three passed by him, it seemed to him as if all the other folk thereabout had vanished and were naught. Nor had he any vision befo uh, before his eyes of any looking on them, save himself alone. They went over the gangway into the ship, and he saw them go along the deck till they came to the house on the poop, and entered it, and were gone from his sight. There he stood staring, till, little by little, the thronging people of the quays came into his eyeshot again. Then he saw how the hawser was cast off, and the boats fell to tugging the big ship toward the harbor mouth with the hail and ho of men. Hail and how? I don't know. Then the sail fell down from the yard, and was sheeted home, and filled with, the, filled with the fair wind as the ship's bows ran up on the first green wave outside the haven. Even therewith the shipmen cast abroad a banner, whereon was done in a green field a grim wolf ramping up against a maiden, and so went the ship upon her way. Walter stood a while, staring at her empty place where the waves ran into the haven mouth, and then turned aside toward the Catherine, and at first he was minded to go and ask shipmaster Geoffrey of what he knew concerning the, the said ship and her alien wayfarers. But then it came into his mind that all this was but an imagination or dream of the day, and that he were best to leave it untold to any. So therewith he went his way from the waterside, and through the streets unto his father's house. But when he was but a little way thence, and the door was before him, uh, him seemed for a moment of time that he beheld those three coming out down the steps of stone and into the street, to wit the dwarf, the maiden, and the stately lady. But when he stood still to abide their coming, and looked toward them, lo, there was nothing before him save the goodly house of Bartholomew Golden, and three children and a cur dog playing about the steps thereof and about him were four or five passers-by going about their business. <clears throat> then was he all confused in his mind, and knew not what to make of it, whether those whom he had seemed to see pass aboard ship were but images of a dream, or children of Adam in the very flesh. Howsoever, he entered the house, and found his father in the chamber, and fell to speech with him about their matters. Uh, but for all that he loved his father, and worshipped him as a wise and valiant man, yet at that hour he might not hearken the words of his mouth, so much was his mind entangled in the thought of those three, and they were ever before his eyes, as if they had been painted on a table by the best of limners. And of the two women he thought exceeding much, uh, and cast no white upon himself for running after the desire of strange women, for he said to himself that he, had, that he desired not either of the twain. Nay, he might not tell which of the twain, the maiden or the stately queen, were clearest to his eyes. But sore he desired to see both of them again, and to know what they were. So wore the hours till, Wednesday, till the Wednesday morning. And it was time that he should bid farewell to his father and get aboard ship. But his father led him down to the quays, and on to the Catherine, and there Walter embraced him, not without tears and forebodings, and his heart was full. Then presently the old man went aland, the gangway unshipped, the hawsers cast off, the oars of the towing boat splashed in the dark water, the sail fell down from the yard and was sheeted home, and out plunged the Catherine into the misty sea, and rolled up the, the grey slopes, casting abroad her ancient withal, whereon uh, was the beating of the token of Bartholomew Golden, to wit, a B and a G to the right and the left, 
and there above a cross and a triangle rising from the mist, uh, from the midst. <clears throat> Walter stood on the stern and beheld, yet more with the mind of him than with his eyes. Uh, <clears throat> Walter stood on the stern and beheld, yet more with the mind of him than with his eyes, for it all seemed but the double of what the other ship had done, and the thought of it, uh, as if the twain were beads strung on one st string and led away to, uh, by it to the same place, and thence to go in the like order, and so on again and again, and never to, uh, to draw nigher to each other. <clears throat> all right, next chapter. Okay. <clears throat> Chapter 3. Walter heareth tidings of the death of his father. Fast sailed the Catherine over the seas, and not, bef uh, not befell to tell of, either to herself or her crew. She came to one cheaping town, and then to another, and so on to a third and a fourth, and at each was buying and selling after the manner of Chapman. And Walter not only looked on the doings of his father's folk, but lent a hand, what he might, to help them in all matters, whether it were in seaman's craft or in chaffer. And the further he went, and the longer time wore, the more he was eased of his old trouble wherein his wife and, uh, and her treason had to do. <clears throat> but as for the other trouble, to wit his desire and longing to come up with those three, it yet flickered before him, and though he had not seen them again as one sees people in the streets, and as if he might touch them he, uh, if he would, yet were their images often before his mind's eye, and yet, as time wore, not so often, or nor so troublously, and forsooth both to those about him and to himself he seemed as a man well healed of his melancholy mood. Now they left that fourth stead, and sailed over the seas, and came to a fifth, a great and fair city, a very great and fair city, which they had made more than seven months from Langton on Holm. And by this time was Walter taking heed and joyance in such things as were toward in that fair city, so far from his kindred, and especially he looked on the fair women there, and desired them, and loved them but lightly, as befalleth, uh, as befalleth young men. <clears throat> now this was the last country whereto the Catherine was bound. So there they abode some ten months in a daily chaffer, and in pleasuring them in beholding all that was uh, of rare and goodly, and making merry with the merchants and the townsfolk, and the country folk beyond the gates, and Walter was grown as busy and gay as a strong young man is like to be. And he was, and he was as one who would be fain, uh, who would fain be of some account amongst his own folk. <clears throat> but at the end of this while, it befell on a day as he was leaving his hostel for the booth in the market, and had the door in his hand. There stood before him three mariners in the guise of his own country, and with them was one of clerkly aspect, um, uh, whom he knew at once as his father's scrivener, Arnold Penstrong by the name by name. <clears throat> and when Walter saw him, his heart failed him, and he cried out, Arnold, what tidings? Is all well with the folk at Langton? Said Arnold, Evil tidings are come with me. Matters are ill with thy folk, for I may not hide that thy father, Bartholomew Golden, is dead. God rest his soul. At that word, it was to Walter as if all that trouble which but now had sat so light upon him was once again fresh and heavy, and that his past life of the last few months had never been. 
and it was to him as if he saw his father lying dead in his dead on his bed, and heard the folk lamenting about the house. He held his peace a while, and then he said in a voice as of an angry man, What, Arnold? Did he die in his bed, or how? For he was neither old nor ailing when we parted. Said Arnold, Yea, in his bed he died, but first he was somewhat sword-bitten. Yea, and how? quoth Walter. Said Arnold, When thou art gone, in a few days wearing, thy father sent thy wife out of the house back to her kindred of the Reddings with no honor, and yet with no such shame as, uh, as might have been, without blame to us of, uh, of those who knew the tale of thee and her, which, God of mercy, would, uh, will be pretty much the whole of the city. <clears throat> Nevertheless, the Reddings took it amiss, and would, have a, and would have a moat with us goldings to talk of booting. By ill luck we yea said that for the saving of the city's peace. But what betid? We met in our guild hall, and there befell the talk between us. And in that talk certain words could not be hidden, though they were none too seemly nor too meek. And the said words once spoken drew forth the wetted steel. And there then was the hewing and thrusting. Two of ours were slain outright on the floor, and four of theirs, and many were hurt on either side. Of these was thy father, for as thou mayst well deem, he was not backward in the fray, but despite his hurts, two in the side and one on the arm, he went home on his own feet, and we deemed that we had come to our above. But, the, but well away, it was an evil victory, whereas in ten days he died of his hurts. God have his soul. But now, my master, thou mayst well wot that I am not come to tell thee this only, but moreover to bear the word of the kindred, to wit that thou, shalt, that thou come back with me straight away in the swift cutter which hath borne me in the and the tidings. And thou mayst look to it, that though she be swift and light, she is a keen full weatherly. Then said Walter, This is a bidding of war. Come back, will I, and the Reddings shall wot of my coming. Are ye all bound? Yea, said Arnold. We may anchor up this very day, or tomorrow morn at latest. But what aileth thee, master? that thou starest so wild over my shoulder. I pray thee, take it not so much to heart. Ever it is the want of fathers to depart this world before their sons. But Walter's visage came from, uh, from wrathful... <clears throat> but Walter's visage from wrathful red had become pale, and he pointed up the street and cried out, Look! Dost thou see? See what, master? quoth Arnold. What? Here cometh an ape in gay raiment, belike the beast of some jongleur. Nay, by God's wounds, tis a man, though he be exceeding misshapen like a very devil. Yea, and now there cometh a pretty maid, going as if she were uh, of his of his many. God, I have no idea how to no idea how to say that word. <clears throat> and lo, here a most goodly and noble lady. Yea, I see and doubtless she owneth both the two, and is, uh, and is of the greatest of the folk of this fair city. For on the maiden's ankle I saw an iron ring, which betokeneth thraldom among these aliens. But this is strange, for notice thou how the folk in the street heed not this quaint show, nay, not even the stately lady, though she be as lovely as a goddess of the Gentiles, and beareth on her gems that would, be, uh, and beareth on her gems that would buy Langton twice over, Surely they must be overwont to, uh, to strange and gallant sights. But now, master, but now. Yea, what is it? said Walter. Why, master, they should not be gone out of eyeshot. Yet they are. What has become of them? Are they sunk into the earth? Tush, man, said Walter, looking not on Arnold, but still staring down the street. They have gone into some house while thine eyes were turned from them a moment. Nay, master, nay, said Arnold. Mine eyes were not off them one instant of time. Well, said Walter, somewhat snappishly, they are gone now. And what, uh, and what have we 
uh, and what have we to do to heed such toys, we with all this grief and strife on our hands? Now would I be alone to turn the matter of thine errand over in my mind. Meantime do thou tell the shipmaster Geoffrey and our other folk of these tidings, and thereafter get thee all ready, and come hither to me before sunrise to-morrow, and I shall be ready for my part, and so sail we back to Langton. Therewith he, he turned him back into the house, and the others went their ways. But Walter sat alone in his chamber a long while, and pondered these things in his mind. And whiles he made up his mind that he would think no more of the vision of those three, but would fare back to Langton, and enter into the strife with the Reddings, and quell them, or die else. But lo, when he was quite steady in this doom, and his heart was lightened thereby, he found that he thought no more of the Reddings and their strife, but as matters that were past and done with, and that now he was thinking and devising if by any means he might find out in what land dwelt those three. And then again he strove to put that from, uh, to put that from him, saying that what he had seen was but meat uh, for one brain sick and a dreamer of dreams. But furthermore he thought, yea, and was Arnold, who this last time had seen the images of those three, a dreamer of waking dreams? For he was not wanted in such wise. Then thought he, at least I am well content that he spake to me of their likeness, not I to him. For so I may tell that there was uh, at least something before my eyes, which grew not out of mine own brain. And yet again, why should I follow them? And what should I get by it? And indeed, how shall I set about it? Thus he turned the matter over and over, and at last, seeing that if he grew no foolisher over it, he grew no wiser, he became weary thereof, and bestirred him, and saw to the trussing up of his goods, uh, and made all ready for his departure. And so wore the day, and slept at nightfall. And at daybreak comes Arnold to lead him to their keel, which hight the Bartholomew. He tarried not, and with few farewells went aboard, aboard the ship. And an hour later they were in, op in the open sea, with the ship's head turned toward Langton on home. All right, we can do another chapter. Here we go, would be on the world, chapter 4. Storm befalls the Bartholomew, and she is driven off her course. Hang on. Storm befalls the Bartholomew, and she is driven off her course. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Stein. <clears throat> Now swift sailed the Bartholomew for four weeks toward the northwest with a fair wind, and all was well with the ship and crew. Then the wind died out on even of a day, so that the ship scarce made way at all, though she rolled in a great swell of the sea, so, so great that it seemed to ridge all the main athwart. Moreover, down in the west was a great bank of cloud huddled up in, a ha huddled up in haze, whereas for twenty days past the sky had been clear, save for a few bright white clouds flying before the wind. <clears throat> and now the shipmaster, a man right cunning in his craft, looked long on sea and sky, and then turned and bade the mariners take in sail and be right heedful. And when Walter asked him what he looked for, and wherefore he spake not to him thereof, he said surlily, why should I tell thee what any fool can see without telling, to wit that there is weather to hand? <clears throat> so they abode what should befall, 
and Walter went to his room to sleep away the uneasy while, for the night was now fallen, and he knew no more till he was waked up by the uh, by great hubbub and clamor of the sa of the shipmen, and the whipping of ropes and thunder of flapping sails, and the tossing and weltering of the ship withal. But being a very stout-hearted young man, he lay still in his room partly because he was a landsman and had no mind to tumble about amongst the shipmen and hinder them, and withal he said to himself, What matter whether I go down to the bottom of the sea or come back to Langton, since either way my life or my death will take away from me the fulfillment of desire? Yet, soothly, if there had been a shift of wind, that is not so ill, for then shall we be driven to other lands, and so at the least our homecoming shall be delayed and other tidings may, uh, may hap amidst of our tarry, tarrying. <clears throat> so let it be, be as it will. So in a little while, in spite of the ship's wallowing and the tumult of the wind and waves, he fell asleep again, and woke no more till it was full daylight. And there was the shipmaster standing in the door of his room, the sea water all streaming from his wet weather raiment. He said to Walter, Young master, the seal of the day to thee. For by good hap we have gotten into another day. Now I shall tell thee that we have striven to beat, so as not to be driven off our course, but all would not avail. Wherefore, for these three hours we have been running before the wind. But, fair sir, so big hath been the sea, that but for our ship being of the stoutest, and our men all yare, uh, we had all grown exceeding wise concerning the ground of the midmain. Praise be to St. Nicholas and all hallows. For though ye shall presently look upon a new sea, and maybe a new land to boot, yet is that better than looking on the ugly things down below. Is all well with, the, with ship and crew, then? said Walter. Yea, forsooth, said the shipmaster. Verily the Bartholomew is the darling of oak woods. Come up and look at it, how she is dealing with wind and waves, all free from fear. So Walter did on his foul, did, so Walter did on his foul weather raiment, and went up to the quarter deck. And indeed there was a change of days, for the sea was dark and tumbling mountain high, and the white horses were running down the valleys thereof, and the clouds drave low over all, and bore a scud of rain along with them. And though there was but a rag of sail on her, the ship flew before the wind, rolling a great wash of water from bulwark to bulwark. Walter stood looking on it all the while, holding on by a stay rope, saying to himself that it was well that they were driving so fast toward new things. Then the shipmaster came up to him and clapped him on the shoulder and said, Well, shipmate, cheer up, and now come below again and eat some meat and drink a cup with me. So Walter went down, and ate and drank, and his heart was lighter than it had been since he had, since he had heard of his father's death, and the feud awaiting him at home, which, forsooth, he had deemed would stay his wanderings a weary while, and therewith all his hopes. But now it seemed as if he needs must wander. Uh, would he? Would he not? And so it was that, uh, and, and so it was that even this fed his hope and sore his heart clung to that desire, the desire of his to seek home uh, to those three that seemed to call him unto them. <clears throat> All right. Uh, chapter 5? Is that going to be the last chapter we do tonight? Maybe not. Let's see. All right, chapter five. Now they come to a new land. Three days they drave before the wind. And on the fourth the clouds lifted, the sun shone out, 
and the offing was clear. The wind had much abated, though it still blew a breeze, and was a headwind for sailing toward the country of Langton. So then the master said that, since they were bewildered, and the wind so ill to deal with, it were best to go still before the wind that they might make some land and get knowledge of their whereabouts from the folk thereof. Withal he said that he deemed the land not to be very far distant. So did they, and sailed on pleasantly enough, for the weather kept on mending, and the wind fell till it was but a light breeze, and yet still foul for Langton. Yo! Stein! Cheered four bits! Woo! Able to! <clears throat> All right. To the chapter. Uh, yes. So wore three days. And on the eve of the third, the man from the topmast cried out that he saw land ahead, and so did they all before the sun was quite set, though it were but a cloud no bigger than a man's hand. When night fell, they struck not sail, but went forth toward the land fair and softly, for it was early summer, so that the nights were neither long nor dark. But when it was broad daylight, they opened a land, a long shore of rocks and mountains, and naught else that they could see at first. Nevertheless, as day wore and they, grew and they drew nigher, first they saw how the mountains fell away from the sea, and were behind a long wall of sheer cliff, and coming nigher yet, they beheld a green plain going up after a little green, uh, going up after a little in green bents and slopes to the feet of the said cliff wall. No city nor haven did they see there, not even when they were far nigher to the land. Nevertheless, whereas they hankered for the peace of the green earth after all the tossing and unrest of the sea, and whereas also they doubted not to find at the, uh, at the least good and fresh water, and belike other bait in the, uh, in the plain under the mountains, they still sailed on not unmerrily, so that by nightfall they cast anchor in five fathom water hard by the shore. Next morning, they found that they were lying a little way off the mouth of a river, not right great. So they put out their boats and, and towed the ship up into the, into the said river. And when they had gone up for a mile or thereabouts, they found the sea water failed. For, for little was the ebb and flow of the tide on that coast. Then was the river deep and clear, running between the smooth grassy land like the meadows, uh, li running between smooth grassy land like to meadows. Also on their left board they saw presently three head of neat cattle going, as if in a, metal, uh, as if in a meadow of a homestead, in their own land, and a few sheep, and thereafter about a, 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 bow, a, a bow draft from the, from the river, they saw a little house of wood and straw thatch under a wooded mound, and with orchard trees about it. They wondered little thereat, for they knew no cause why that land should not be builded, uh, though it were in the far outlands. However, they drew their ship up to the bank, thinking that they would at least abide a while and ask tidings and have some refreshing of the green plain which was so lovely and pleasant. But while they were busied herein, they saw a man come out of the house and down to the river to meet them. And they soon saw that he was tall and old, long hoary of hair and beard, and clad mostly in the skins of beasts. He drew nigh without any fear or mistrust, and coming close to them, he gave them the seal of the day in a kindly and pleasant voice. The shipmaster greeted him in his turn, and said withal, Old man, art thou the king of this country? The elder laughed. It hath had none other a long while, said he, and at least there is no other son of Adam here to gainsay. Thou art alone here, then, said the master. Yes, said the old man, save for the beasts of the field and the wood, and the creeping things and fowl. Wherefore it is sweet to me to hear your voices, said the master. Where be the other houses of the town? The old man laughed. Said he, when I said that I was alone, 
I meant that I was alone in the land, and not only alone in this stead. There is no house save this betwixt the sea and the dwellings of the bears, over the cliff wall yonder, yea, and a long way over it. Yea, quoth the shipmaster, grinning. And be the bears of thy country so manlike that they dwell in builded houses? The old man shook his head. Sir, said he, as to their bodily fashion, it is altogether manlike, save that they be one and all higher and bigger than most, for they be bears only in name. They be a nation of half-wild men, for I have been told by them that there be many more of that tribe whose folk I have not seen, and that they spread wide about behind those mountains, <clears throat> these mountains from east to west. Now, sir, as to their souls and understandings, I warrant them not, for miscreants they be, crowing neither in God nor his hallows. Said, uh, said the master, How they in Mahound, then? <laughs> what does this mean? I'm sorry, I was, this is ridiculous. <laughs> what does this mean? I've got to look this one up. Oh, he's asking if they're Muslim. Holy shit. What an old-timey way to say Muhammad. All right. So are they Muslim? <laughs> Nay, said the elder. I wot not for sure that they have so much as a false god though I have it from them that they worship a certain woman with mickle worship. Then spake Walter, Yea, good sir, and how knowest thou that? Dost thou deal with them at all? Uh, said the old man, While some of that folk come hither and have of me what I can spare, a calf or two, or a half dozen of lambs or hoggets, or a skin of wine or cider of mine own making, and they give me in return such things as I can use, as skins of hart and bear and other peltries, for now I am old, I can but little of the hunting hereabout. Whiles also they bring little lumps of pure copper, and would give me gold also. But it is of little use in this lonely land. Sooth to say, to me they are not masterful or rough-handed, but glad I am that they, have been, uh, that they have been here but of late, and are not like to come again this while, for terrible they are of aspect, and whereas ye be aliens, belike they would not hold their hands from off you, and moreover ye have weapons and other matters which they would covet sorely. Quoth the master, Since thou dealest with these wild men, will ye not deal with us in chaffer? Uh, for whereas... We are come from long travel. We hanker after fresh fit, fresh, I don't know. Would you, is this pronounced vittle, or would you ever pronounce it victual? I'm going to say fresh vittle. We hanker after fresh vittle. And here aboard are many things for, uh, which were for thine avail. Said the old man, All that I have is yours so that ye do but leave me enough for my, uh, till my next ingathering of wine and cider, such as, it is, such as it is. I have plenty for your service. Ye may drink it till it is all gone, if ye will. A little corn and meal I have, but not much. Yet are ye welcome to there too, since the standing corn in my garth is done blossoming, and I have other meat. Cheeses have I, and dried fish, Take what ye will thereof. But as to my neat and sheep, if ye have sore need of any, and will have them, I may not say you may. Uh, sorry, <clears throat> I may not say you nay, but I pray you, if you may do without them, if you may do without them, not to take my milch beasts or their engenderers. As ye have, for as ye have heard me say, the bear folk have been here but of late and they have had of me all I might spare. But now let me tell you, if ye long after flesh meat, that there is venison of heart and hind, yea, and of buck and doe. 
uh, to be had on this plain. And about the little woods at the feet of the rock wall yonder, neither are they exceeding wild, for since I may not take them, I scare them, I scare them not, and no other man do they see to hurt them. For the bear folk come straight to my house, and fare straight home thence. But I will lead you the nighest way, to where the venison is easiest to be gotten. As to the wares in your ship, if you will give me aught, I will take it with a good will. And chiefly, if you have a fair knife or two, and a roll of linen cloth, that were a good refreshment to me. But in any case, what I have to give is free to you and welcome. The shipmaster laughed. Friend, said he, we can thee mickle thanks for all that thou biddest us. And what well that we be no lifters or sea thieves to take thy livelihood from thee. So tomorrow, if thou wilt, we will go with thee and upraise the hunt. And meanwhile we will come a land and walk on the green grass and water our ship with thy good fresh water. So the old carl went back to his house to make them ready what cheer he might. And the shipmen, who were twenty and one, all told, what with the mariners and Arnold and Walter's servants, went ashore, all but two who watched the ship and abode their turn. They went well weaponed, for both the master and Walter deemed wariness wisdom, lest all might not be so good as it seemed. They took of their sailcloths ashore and tilted them in on the meadow betwixt the house and the ship, and the carl brought them what he had for their avail of fresh fruits and cheeses, and milk, and wine, and cider, and honey, and there they feasted no wise ill, and were right fain. Uh, yeah. That's the last chapter. Five chapters is good. Until next time. Only on, always on, Able to.